بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة وسلام على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أدائهم أجمعين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما أصابك من حسنات فمن الله وما أصابك من سيئات فمن نفسك Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Holy Quran Surah 4 Surah Nisa uh, Ayat 79 What comes to you of good is from Allah and what comes to you of evil is from your own self Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is adil is all just he does not do any injustice to anyone. What does justice mean? Justice means giving everyone their rights. Sometimes we see someone, they don't have the necessities of their livelihood. They don't have necessities of life. But it's not due to Allah being unjust. It's due to a lot of uh, other circumstances in life. Wa alaykum salam. So someone might not have the proper things they need and they say, okay, someone brings the argument, uh, Allah is unjust, look, this person, they're homeless, they don't have the things that they need. But it is not due to Allah being unjust. If everyone were following the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were following their imam, there would be no poverty. As we see in the time where Imam Zaman, ajallah ta'ala, farajahu sharif, Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He said there will be a time when, when he reappears that the people will want to pay zakat and they will not find anyone to pay it to because the wealth is distributed in the proper way. So we see that a lot of times people are in bad situations sometimes because the money and the wealth is not distributed in the right, in the right way. People are not paying their uh, obligatory charities and are not helping other people. So it's not the fault of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is something that comes from mankind. So tonight I want to bring a lot of shubahat, these doubts that people bring and they throw us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unjust. We don't believe in an unjust God. So we're going to address some of those things tonight. And that is one of them. So we see that other people hoard wealth they have millions and billions and tons of money. They hoard their money and they don't help other people. If they're following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no one needs billions and billions of dollars. They can use this money and help other people and still live good life. But they want to hoard their wealth and they live good and they look at other people and they don't help them. This is not the way of Islam. So the injustice does not go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It goes back to people who are doing these things and other people are suffering. We see a lot of Middle Eastern countries, one ruler or his family or some other places are living in palaces and other people are struggling. While they are living good and having private jets and doing all sorts of things, other people can find food to eat. This is unjust. Injustice of that person is not due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's doing due to this man being unjust. When we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam says, Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. Allah has fixed the livelihood of the destitute, the poor. Their livelihood is in the wealth of the rich. Consequently, whenever a destitute or a poor person remains hungry, it is become some, because some rich person has denied him his share, and Allah will question them about that. So we see that our Imam is saying this, that the, the livelihood sometimes is in the money with the rich, and the rich will be tested on how they use their money and how they spend their money. We see that our sixth Imam, he says, on Resurrection Day, Allah will apologize to the needy believer. Those who went through struggles and they were needy and they went through poverty in this life, Allah will apologize to them on the Day of Judgment. 
just as a brother apologizes to his brother. Allah says, I swear by my honor, I didn't make you poor to humiliate you. So Allah will apologize to that person for what they went to. And they says that I didn't make you poor to humiliate you. Push this curtain aside and see what I have given you instead. For all the sufferings they went through being poor and going through poverty, we see that there's no end to it and we feel uh, like it's choking us if we're in that situation. Allah says, don't worry, push this curtain aside and see what I have for you on this day. Then the man pushes the curtain aside and he looks at what Allah has given him instead of this world. He will say that there was no harm for me as to what you took away from me in this dunya. Considering all that you have given me now and hereafter. So this man, even if he probably had the chance to go back and be rich after he saw all the things he got, this is no problem. Everything is good. I've got a lot of reward for being patient and going through all those trials. Our seventh Imam, Imam Qadam alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, Allah did not say, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I did not make the rich ones rich for their honor near me. And I didn't make the poor ones poor for their humiliation near me. Has nothing to do with honor or humiliation. He says, rather, this is how I test the rich by the poor people. If there were no poor people, none of the rich people would be certified to be able to go to heaven. So the poor people are a test for the rich people. Will they help them or not? So this is their way to obtain Jannah. Those who have a lot of money is to help poor people. And this is their way. We should all, there's no problem with having money, but we should ask Allah to give us money, give us wealth in order to do the right thing with it and to help others with that money. I was watching a movie one time about this uh, Christian family, right? And they were really active in their church and everything. And then we had one of their daughters, Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, you get this for me. Sorry. Thank you. So, these people in this church, they had a uh, daughter. They were really active. They did a lot of things in their church. And then their daughter got diagnosed with some disease. They couldn't cure the disease. So they started having doubts. Everything was good whenever, when things were going fine. They had no problem. Now the, their daughter had a disease, so they started getting doubts. They said, why is Allah doing this to me? Allah is not answering my prayers. You know, does Allah hear my prayers? And then this led them all the way down the path to basically denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they went through some trial. But we have to know life is full of trials, ups and downs. But it made them doubt the existence and Allah altogether because something happened to their child and they were active in center and all of this thing. And you know, uh, it made them question everything that they believed in. And we, I see this too sometimes in, in the communities. It happens. Certain things happen. It's, why is Allah punishing me? What did I do? All of these things. And, you know, a lot of the generation now, teenagers or college age, some of them, they get these doubts and they don't know how to answer them. And then they go towards the atheism because one doubt leads to another doubt and another doubt. And then next thing you know, just because one question wasn't answered, now they reject everything or they can't answer one thing in the Quran. They have one doubt about the Quran. They say, I don't believe this thing here came from Allah. So their one doubt in that one ayah leads them to doubt in the whole book and reject the whole book. And we have answers for everything with Quran and Ahlul Bayt. We just have to dig a little bit and find the answer and we can find it. And we don't know, we have to go and ask. We can't let the doubt continuously go on in our mind because it will disturb us and our way of thinking and all of these things. We have to find the solution for the doubt. And you know, even now, these youth that are going towards that path, they're starting to, you know, even mock other people who are believing in Allah. 
They're mocking other people for being Shias. They're mocking people for believing in Allah, for being in Islam. They're saying, oh, why are you going through all of those motions and praying? Allah doesn't hear your prayers. I prayed one time and he didn't answer me, so now I don't believe in Allah. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that, you know? But they're going down this type of path. So, you know, the root of all that problems is ignorance. It's lack of knowledge. That's the problem. If we have a firm foundation in our beliefs, then we won't have those problems. But we have to dig deep into our aqaid, our beliefs. That's the most important. It doesn't matter if you know every fiqh masail and your aqaid is messed up. Aqaid is fiqh al-akbar. You have to have good beliefs. What is the point of you doing all this ahkam and your beliefs aren't, they're messed up? We have to have a good grasp on Tawheed, Nubawad, Imamat, Ma'ad, all of these things. So that is one thing. So we have to study and we have to learn the rational arguments to refute these type of doubts when they come. Don't be afraid of the doubt. The doubt comes, okay, we have ammunition to go against the doubt, let's take it on. And we're going to go, and we're going to go research. No problem, we don't know right now. We'll go back and we'll research and we'll come back. And we try to prove the doubt wrong. We try to bring Quran. We bring Rawayat, narrations from Ahlul Bayt. We bring our Aqal, our intellect. We bring various scholars said different things. We can go and look at a lot of different things to come and prove every belief that we have. So we have to go in, and we have books like this. There's a lot of books that have, uh, one of the books I studied in the, in the Hausa, Aqad al-Haqqa, it's an Arabic book, right? Sayyid Ali Hussein Sadr. And he brings every belief we have, basically, almost all of the beliefs. And he brings them, and he brings first Quran. Then he brings narrations. Then he brings the akal. Then he brings ijma, if that's applicable, the consensus from the earlier scholars. And it's very beautiful because we find a lot of support for all of our beliefs. And inshallah, if you're able to read the Arabic books, it would be very good. And pray for me, I get tawfiq one day, I can try to translate this work, inshallah. So one of these questions and these doubts that people bring is why does a loving God allow suffering? Valid question, valid doubt. People bring it all the time. So why does Allah, he's supposed to be loving, he allows people to suffer in the world. So I see people suffering in the world. Allah must not love them. So I don't believe in this God. This is what people say. It's all because of this one thing that I would say at least like half of the people are atheists from just this one doubt. So they say, if there's a God, we shouldn't see such horrible things in the earth. We shouldn't see such horrible things in the world. All these catastrophes and all these people starving and going without things. Allah doesn't love them and answer them. This is the doubt. So when they don't have the, qu the answer for the doubt, their faith gets shaken. People come to them and say, well, answer this for me. And you don't know, and it just starts to shake the youth. This is one of the questions that comes. So we have to be able to answer it. As youth, you have to be able to learn how to answer it. And parents, you have to be able to learn when your children come to you and ask you that. So the questioner who's making this doubt, he's saying, Allah doesn't love these people. So he's allowing, because he's allowing them to suffer. So he says that this God must be unjust because he's allowing them to suffer. So the thing that's preventing him from believing in Allah is not that he rejects that there can be a God. He rejects an unjust God. He says, if there's a God, there wouldn't be this suffering here. I reject a God that allows this type of suffering. So he rejects an unjust God. Okay, he's not rejecting Allah, he's just rejecting an unjust God. We reject unjust God too. We believe Allah is Adil. So now we have to show the person that his perception of what is just and unjust is maybe wrong. We have to look at what is just and what is unjust. So some people, they come and attribute that injustice or wrongdoing, evil, comes from Allah. Stuck for Allah. We saw the ayat, all good comes from Allah, all evil comes from mankind. Okay, then they bring the ayat, uh, 
قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقَ they said, from the, we seek refuge in Allah from the evil that He created. They said, look, Allah created evil. It's in Quran. No, it's not that. And what we're saying, we're seeking refuge in the evil of what He created. Allah created mankind. Mankind can do what? He can do good, he can do evil. We're seeking refuge in Allah from the evil that mankind is doing. Not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created evil. We're seeking refuge in the evil from what He created. He created man. Man does evil. We're seeking refuge from that evil. So the way they are looking at the ayah is wrong. This would be coming from a Muslim person who may bring this. But and someone from outside, they're going to bring uh, different things. These creatures, you know, they misuse the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. Allah only creates good, doesn't create evil. Things that became evil, came evil on their own choice later on. Not that Allah created them that way. They made choice. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created grapes. Is anything wrong with grapes? No. We eat grapes? No problem. Subhanallah. Okay. But can you misuse grapes? You ferment them and you can make wine out of them. Did Allah create the wine? No. He gave you the grapes and you misused it. The person took the grapes, he could have done two things. He had a choice. He can do halal or he can do haram. We have a knife on the table. We can cut a tomato with that knife, or we can take that knife and we can stab someone and kill them. Choice is us. Does Allah do that, force that? No. It's up to the person in order to make the choice, right or left. Which way did they want to go? So there's a lot of things that Allah gives people things and they misuse the blessings. And that's where the evil comes from. And when we misuse those things that Allah has given us, that's why Allah says the good comes from Him and the evil comes from your own self. Allah gave us good things. We misuse them and then get bad results out of them. This is where that comes from. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A lot of questions they have about unjust God suffering in the world, they're related to children most of the time with special needs a lot of times. Or some people who may have been born with some deformities or something like this. Or natural disasters or poverty, these things. They bring all of these things and they say, Allah cannot be just. Allah cannot be just because we have this, this and this. It's unfair, it's unjust. But we see that, we said in the beginning, all good comes from Allah, all evil comes from our own self. So we have to find a solution for that. So we see that there are a lot of things that mankind does, and he doesn't know the effects of those things. And then later on, he finds out the effects of those things. You think you're doing something good at one moment, and then we find out that thing is dangerous. Think about the, we can look in here, and the walls, walls have paint. Wasn't it not too long ago, they were using lead-based paint, and now they found out that's dangerous. They don't use it anymore. Or we have uh, just recently some medicines they find. Now they say these medicines were good. Doctors are prescribing them for years, and now they see this medicine causes cancer. Let's take it off the shelf. Because they did research and they found out now this thing led to something bad. So a lot of times people are doing things and they don't know the results of those things until research comes out later. So these things that people are doing to the environment cause results. They don't know their, what results they're causing, but the pollution can cause a lot of results, bad results. The results in the water can lead to let's say, uh, deformities or special needs. If someone is drinking polluted water, it could, or they have pollution in the air. Some of these things they find that they've traced it back to maybe the third trimester of the woman's pregnancy and says something happens in this time with the environment, maybe pollution, and it can lead to this defect or something like this. So it's something that mankind is doing 
that we're maybe not aware of it, but it's leading to some other results. So a lot of times we see people are considering a hardship also, a hardship from Allah when it is in fact from mankind themselves. So this is one way to answer some of these questions. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We see Allah says in Surah 29, Ayat 10, And the, of the people are some who say, We believe in Allah. But when one of them is harmed for the cause of Allah, they consider the trial of the people as if it were a punishment of Allah. But if victory comes from your Lord, they say, Indeed, we were with you. Is not Allah most, most knowing of what was within the breast of all the creatures? So sometimes we see that mankind is something that comes from people. It says, a trial of the people. and But they blame it on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say, this is a punishment from Allah. But it was really what the people were doing themselves. It was a trial from the people. So sometimes these natural disasters, for example, it can be a punishment for mankind. It can be a punishment for a nation. We have many nations that were punished by Allah because of something they did. And then at other times, that might not be the case. We don't know. It could be a punishment from Allah, or it could be something that mankind has done. And we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He rescued those people who were in those situations, like the flood of Nuh alayhi salam. Allah rescued the believers and had them in the ark or the ship with Noah. And other people with, for example, Lut his, uh, alayhi salam, his people were punished. But Allah saved him and some of the believers with him. But let's say, okay, someone brings this and says, okay, we know some very good people, and they died a really tragic death. What about them? They were good believers. They came to center. They attended majalis. They were active in majlis. They were helping people, and they died such a horrible death. What about them? Isn't that unjust? They say, Allah did that to to those people and they were doing the best and we look at we could they can come and bring maybe they say look at uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam was the best of my Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad was the best of mankind and he was killed in this way shouldn't have Allah have done this they bring all of these doubts so we see if some believer for example was hit by a car or uh, eaten by an animal or something, attacked by an animal or something like this and killed in a really tragic way. You know, we have a lot of narrations that say dying in, these w in this way is alleviation for sins that they have and Allah will reward them with paradise. We have from Imam Bakr alayhi salam. <coughs> He's speaking about Nabi Musa alayhi salam. He said, when Musa left the house, he met one of his fellow Israelites. He went to the mountain of Tur and with him, and he asked him to sit down till he returned. So picture Nabi Musa is going to the mountain with his friend. And he tells his friend, I am going up here. You cannot come this far, but you sit down at the bottom of the mountain and wait for me. He drew a circle around his friend and then he raised his head toward the sky and he says, Ya Allah, I entrust you with my friend. You are the best guardian. And then he left and went to the mountain, left his friend at the bottom. He says, I went away and made dua to Allah and then I returned and he saw that an, a lion had attacked his friend, tore him to pieces and he died. He ate his friend. So Musa raised his head toward the heavens again. And he said, Ya Allah, I entrusted him with you. You're the best protector. But you let the worst beast come and eat him and kill him and tear him to pieces. So why is this? So Allah sent a revelation, said, Ya Musa, your friend had a rank in the heaven that he couldn't obtain unless he went through this trial. And he removed the curtain for him, if we can say, for Musa to see in the heavens. He said, the curtains of the unseen were drawn aside, and Musa looked on his friend, and he saw him in an exalted palace, a house in Jannah. And Musa said, I am pleased. So this man 
companion of a prophet, but he was killed in a tragic way. But since he died in that tragic way, he obtained the Jannah. We have other narrations that say people who are died, burned in the fire, or they are drowned, and a few other things, that those people will go to Jannah for the tragic death that they had to face. We see Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, Umma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. If a believer only knew what the reward for the perseverance in the face of calamities, he would always be wished to torn to pieces. If he only knew what lied ahead, he would wish all the time that he was just torn to pieces. So the calamities, sometimes we view them as something bad, but if we, if we don't complain about them and we say Alhamdulillah and we persevere through those calamities, we get a lot of rewards for those. Also he says, any believer is reminded of a tragedy every 40 days, either a financial tragedy, a physical tragedy, or for himself or for his children, or even a sort of sadness which he doesn't understand the reason for that sadness, and then he'll be rewarded for those things. A lot of times we face a lot of tragedies and we don't know where they come from. And a lot of times these are things to raise our status. The more belief we have, the more of the tragedies we have. It's like a scale. So we have to expect the tragedies, and we have to take them in, in the right way. We see that our fifth Imam, he says, Whenever Allah wishes to honor one who has committed sins, He will make him ill, He will make him needy, He will make him suffer from a difficult death to compensate for his sins. So if we have sins, sometimes we go through some things in this life, so that after we die, we are clean. It is all gone. We suffer a tragic death. For example, we go through hardships here. And a lot of times the people who are going to Ziyara, they know, or have been to Ziyara, they know, whenever you try to go to Ziyara, you're always going to face some sort of difficulty. The visa is not going to come to the last moment. Your flight is going to get delayed. You're going to worry about one thing or the next thing or something happens all the time. Every time I go to the ZR, I just start looking for it now. I just know that something is coming. I don't know what it is, but I just have to be ready for it and say Alhamdulillah and, and just do my best. We have to be ready for tragedies and ready for calamities. So the Imam, he says, whenever Allah wishes to humiliate someone who has done some good deeds, let's say someone has done some good deeds, but he's maybe disbeliever and rejects Allah, but he has done good deeds, he will make him perfectly healthy, improve his living conditions, make a death easy for him to compensate for his good deeds in this world before he goes to meet his Lord. So a lot of time we have the, the sins. We go through the tragic death and we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any sin. If we have more sin, maybe we have to get punished and barzakh. Na'udhu billah. Allah save us from those things. Sometimes we see some things that are harmful. We see them. Uh, they're not always bad things. We think they're bad, but they're not bad. So our perception could be wrong. For example, we see snakes and we're like, I don't want anything to do with the snakes. They're all bad. I don't know why Allah created snakes, for example. They could bite me and do, you know, I'm scared of snakes and this and that. We can bring all of these things. So we see the snakes as bad. But if we didn't have the snakes, we would have an over infestation of rats and other things. So they play their role. We see them as bad, but maybe they could be good. And if we had too many, if we didn't have the snakes, we'd have too many rats and our life would be miserable. And then we'd be, have another thing to complain about. So also some people, they hate the spiders. The spiders are bad, you know. But the spiders, they capture other insects and they kill other insects. So our perception, a lot of times, it could be wrong. Something we see is bad, it could actually be good. We have to look at those prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to us. We have to, Allah put all their stories in the Quran. We have to look at them, their instruction guides for us, because we might face the similar problem and we know how to deal with it. We have to look at, you know, they were the greatest men of their times. The hujjatullah, the proof of Allah in the earth. 
the one Allah appointed for us to follow and for their communities and their times to follow. Why were they afflicted with so many tragedies? They didn't have any sins, so someone may bring this doubt. They say he was the highest person. For example, Rasulullah, he was the highest one in the standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best of creation. Why did he go through more tragedies than anyone else and any of the other prophets? He didn't have any sin, he was ma'asum, so why did he go through hardships? We have answer for it, we have narration. All we have to do is go back to Imams, to have the narrations for everything. I've said many times, we have a lot of books, it's right at our fingertip. We can just go look. We see that someone asked Imam Bakr alayhi salam, same question. Muhammad. He said, Oh, may, may I be your devoted servant. When we read the verse, whatever misfortune happens to you is because of the thing that your hands have done. Does it mean that the misfortunes that happened to the Prophet and that happened to Amir al-Mu'mineen and Ahl al-Bayt were due to sins? This is what this companion is asking because he really wants to know. He says, may I be your devoted servant. So he's not saying it in a negative way, but someone is probably bringing this doubt to him and he needs to know how to answer. So he said, they didn't do anything. So why, why, why how does this ayat come into effect here? The Imam answers him, he says, their misfortunes were not due to sins, but their misfortunes were so extensive. They suffered so much that they'll get rewarded for them. It only increases their ranks higher and higher and higher. It wasn't due to sins, but they suffered a lot because they are the highest in creation and they will be in the highest position. We have to take examples from Quran to follow. We have to look at Ayyub, Nabi Ayyub salam. He lost everything. He was very sick. Did Nabi Ayyub salam ever quit praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. Did he ever complain? No. I've seen this happen to someone. He was uh, in the jail, had a life sentence. He prayed and prayed and prayed. Allah granted him, he got out. He got out, he found he had cancer. So he said, I, Allah did this and let me out and now I have cancer. So what, what kind of uh, Allah, you know, stuck for Allah, these are the things he's saying. So he left Islam and he came back to the, to the, ended up going back to the jail. But he left Islam because of that, because he had a cancer. We have to look, Nabi Ayyub salam was sick. He had the cancer, he didn't have cancer, but he had sickness. This other guy had cancer, similar thing. If we get sick, just say, Alhamdulillah, no matter what our situation is, is good or bad, we have to say Alhamdulillah. We have to look at the story of the person on the boat in the Quran. He says he was in the boat and the boat is rocking back and forth and that big storm is coming. And then he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please let me get to the land. I'll be the best mu'min, basically. I'll do whatever you want. Just let me get to the land. I'm terrified. I don't want to die out here. So he goes and gets to the land, and Allah granted him his need, his answer. He got to land. What did he do? He said he turned his back and forgot all about his promise. And he forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of us have been through some trouble no matter what it was, we were in that situation like the man in the boat. We felt like it was impossible. Call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from that calamity, whatever it is. But when Allah saves us, we have to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not be like the man in the boat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We see that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He suffered most of all. He went through so many tragedies in his life. This musibah is great. It's so, it's, it's very heavy. But he lost all, he lost his sons. He had several sons that were born to him and they all died very young. Do we see Prophet ever complain? No. 
We see Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam that she saw Aun and Muhammad killed in front of her. Did she complain? No, she thanked Allah for her sacrifice for Imam Hussein, that she had something to give towards Imam Hussein. So I was telling the youth earlier, there's two ways to look at the problem. We can complain about it, which does no good, or we can say, Alhamdulillah, and know that Allah will give us reward for those things. We see that all, all of these prophets, we have all of these stories, and those stories are for us to follow in their footsteps, to put them into practice. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 29, Surah Ankabut, Ayat 2 and 3, he says, do people think that they will be left to say that we believe and they won't be tested? We have surely tried those before them. And Allah will make evident those who are truthful and those who are liars. We cannot think that we will go through this life and it will be all easy, that we won't receive any tests. Now another ayat, Surah Baqarah, ayat 155 one, through 157. Surely we will test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and fruits and be, give good tidings to the patient ones. Those when disaster strikes them, they say, Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'oon. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Those are the ones upon whom are the blessings from their Lord and mercy, and it is those who are the rightly guided. When we really take a look at that statement, inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'un, we say it all the time. But when we come to the reality of what it is, when we know that we are from Allah and we are going back to Him, that is the ultimate reality. We know and we will prepare for it and anything else along the way. We know that our ultimate goal is returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Ya ayu aladina amanu sta'inu bi sabri wa salati inna Allah ma'as sabirin. O you who believe, seek help with patience. Seek help with prayer. Allah is with the patient ones. So Allah tells us how to deal with the problems. We have to deal with sabr. We have to have patience. We have to remember Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. When we look at their trials and tribulations and we look at Karbala and we come and remember it all the time. But when we go through a problem, the first thing we should think about is what our imams went through. And when we think about that, nothing else matters at all. When a loved one dies, what do they say that we should do? We should remember Imam Hussein alayhi salam. I remember it was very heartbreaking to see what this big scholar in Najaf, uh, I know him well, and his son died in a car accident along the road coming back from Dua Kamil on a Thursday night. And they came in and they told him about it. And the first thing he did, he started Musibah of Imam Hussein right away. Because when he thought of his son, he immediately thought of all of the sons that Imam Hussein salam lost. He just lost one. He thought about all of the children, Imam Hussein and the relatives that died for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So he just started doing musiba. He didn't go and think about his son right away. So it's recommended when we go through tragedies to recall the sacrifices and recall the tragedies of Karbala. We see that a group of people went to see Imam Sajjad, our fourth Imam, alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It said that the people talked about the calamities that the Shia were going through. They started saying, we we're going through a lot of problems. So they started telling their Imam about them. And then they went to see Imam Hussein alayhi salam and said same thing. We're going through a lot of problems. Started telling him about all of the problems. Listen to what uh, Sayyid al-Shuhada Imam Hussein alayhi salam said. He said, I swear by Allah that the speed with which poverty and calamities rush towards our friends is more faster than the speed of the zebra. More faster than the speed of the flood. More faster than the speed of the rainfall. If you are not suffering in this way, know that you are not from amongst us. So we are true Shia of uh, Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We have to go through tragedies. We have to expect the tragedies. It's nothing new. Shia have been suffering from the very beginning all the way until now. We have to expect it and we have to know how to deal with it. 
This is the thing. He says, in this is the part, he says that expect these things. But listen to what he says after. He's giving us a reassurance. Okay, you are going to go through a lot of problems, but this is what Imam Hussein says. He says, your orphans will be helped by us. Your debts will be repaid by us. And your sins will be forgiven by us. We go through a lot of suffering in this dunya, in the akhirah, they will be there for us. We have a lot of narrations that even at the time of the death, we are on the deathbed, and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam will be around our deathbed. The angels will be there to summarize a long narration. They will say, uh, love this person. They will tell the angel of death, love this person and be kind to him because he was a follower of us. Amir Mu'minin alayhi salam will say that I went, they went through a lot of trouble and hardship and suffering for my sake. Be gentle with him. And then the angel of death will tell them that he will be more kind to them than a father is to his son. This is because the mercy of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam intervening for us. On day of judgment, they will be there to do shafa for us. We will have uh, haqq Allah, the rights of Allah that will be due on us. Uh, those things between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe we have some things that we owe Allah and we weren't able to complete them. He will, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam will intervene and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for his sake, for these things. Allah will say they're forgiven based on Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now he will, we will still have haqqan nas. Maybe we took something from somebody, we owe somebody their rights, we did backbiting on someone or something like this. They say that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam will go to those people and say, please, Forgive this man. I'll give you anything you want as a ransom. Just forgive him. Based on me. The narrations say that when they ask for one thing, they said they want one nafas, one breath of Amir Mumineen on the night that he slept in the Prophet's bed when he made the hijrah. Just one reward for one breath. That's it. And on that day, he says, okay, I give it to you. You can have it. This man is forgiven. He's able to go to Jannah now. Then they will show those people who got the reward for one nafas, what they received in Jannah and what their words were, were that we thought that we had received the whole entire Jannah, that no one else got anything else. And that's the reward for just one breath of Amir al Now, what kind of person Amir al we can never even reach the dust under the feet when we start to talk about the status of Amir al-Mu'maneen alayhi salam but my point is we suffer in this world don't worry about it they will be there for us when we need them or the day we need them the most if we suffer for their sake don't worry about it it's an honor they come they kill us they kill Shia they come in majlis and around the world and they shoot them they they terrorize Shia don't worry about it uh, my my friend has sent my salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad I saw a video my friend sent me the other day was, they're in majlis like this and a bomb blast outside and the speaker was like, just sit down. We're in majlis. We're in the best place. We all will be shaheed. We'll be shaheed together. Labeka ya Hussein. And everyone's saying, Labeka ya Hussein. They didn't, they didn't run or do anything. They all sat there. The same thing. If ISIS is trying to kill people on the way to Karbala, it's dangerous. People say, I don't want to go. Don't worry about it. Go anyway. What better way to die on the path to our master, Abu Abdullah. So don't worry about it. Tragedy is the way, is this, it's the path that we have to take. We have to face some sort of tragedy. We're facing it, Fisa Billallah, in the way of Allah. And we're facing it in the path of Ahlul Bayt. We know that we're going to get rewarded for this. So that's the main thing we have to re remember. Back to topic. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <coughs> Just want to bring a few small points and then we'll end the majlis. 
about Allah being unjust because people bring the fact that they well they come and they say this doubt that Allah is unjust I want to give a few things that without a shadow of a doubt you can prove that Allah is just and is incapable of doing injustice Allah is Adil there is no way around it with just four things if we can remember these four things we'll be able to refute when anyone comes and says Allah is unjust. First, we have to look at the reasons why injustice is done. So the first thing, we com- a person will commit injustice because he's ignorant of the harmful effects of the injustice. So he does injustice, but he doesn't realize what he's doing and the, the harmful effects that it's going to cause. The harmful effects of that sin. He's just doing it. So this is impossible because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be ignorant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing. Therefore, it's impossible to do injustice because he's ignorant of the outcome. Because Allah is all-knowing. Second thing, we are forced to do injustice by someone else. Someone makes us do injustice. They put a gun in, or they intimidate you and say, I will hurt your family if you don't go do this, rob this bank, for example. Okay, they're forcing someone to do injustice. Okay, it's impossible for anyone to force Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful. No one can force Allah to do anything. So Allah is not compelled to do injustice. Third thing, we commit injustice because we need something. We rob someone because we feel we need that thing and we don't have it. So we take it from someone. Let's say injustice. It's a robbery. They say, I need food. I'm going to take the food from the next person because I need that food. It's impossible for Allah to be in need of anything. Allah is al ghani. He is free from need. Allah doesn't need anything. He's the creator of all things. So why is he in need of anything? So it's impossible for Allah to do injustice because he needs something. This is what we do. Fourth thing, we commit injustice because we find pleasure in that. Let's say someone finds pleasure in doing injustice to other people. Okay, this is also impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's not in the need of seeking pleasure of someone else. He doesn't need to seek pleasure from anyone or for himself. So it's impossible from all of these reasons. These are all of the reasons that injustices are done. Allah doesn't fit in any of these categories. So it's impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do injustice to anyone. The injustice has to come from mankind misusing the faculties that Allah has given us. As a believer, we have to come to the realization that this life is just a test for us. Suffering in this world is a test. We cannot try to shift the blame and point it at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allah is uh, unjust to us and that's why we're suffering. We have to realize that life is a test. Allah says in Surah Al-Mulk, Ayat 2, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَحَيَاتَ لَيَبْلُوَاكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورِ He says, he who created life and death to test you as which is in the best of deeds. And he is the mighty and the forgiving. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that this dunya is a test. It's a life and a test. See that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah the Almighty sends calamities upon a believer. He cannot sleep one day and wake up the next morning without any problems. This is the reality for for a believer. He either gets ill or he has a family he has a family or financial problem or suffers from natural disaster. These are all that Allah will reward him with. These are the narrations we have to think of when we go through problems. We have to think of the sunnah of those prophets. We have to think of the sunnah of the imams. And we have to think about these narrations that they say that we are going to go through problems and we'll be rewarded for them. He also says a believer is reminded of a tragedy every 40 days, either financial, physical, or with his children. He also says the people who suffered the worst were the prophets. Prophets were the ones who suffered the worst. Then 
There are those who are similar to the prophets who suffered the worst hardships. When we look at those who suffered worst hardships, we have to we go back and we think about the tragedy of Karbala. And we come here today and we remember the tragedies that they faced. We see that <coughs> Abu Hamza Thumali, he came and asked Imam Shajjar alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He said, my master, Yamna Rasulullah, when will your sadness reduce and your crying stop? Said, Imam, you are crying all the time. When will your sadness ever end? Is there an end to your sadness? Isn't death something normal for you and martyrdom an honor for you? Imam replied, may Allah accept your efforts. Allah took away Yusuf from his father and Prophet Yaqub wept until he became blind and his hair turned white. But as for me, I saw my father and my family slaughtered in front of my very eyes on plain of Karbala. My sadness will continue until the day I meet him. Allah. And we turned. How could Imam Sajjad salam, not cry when remembering the way that they entered into Damascus as captives? When the caravan reached the outskirts of Damascus, Omar bin Sa'ad received the message that the prisoners were not to be brought. Allah. Imam Sajjad, he says, When the caravan reached the outskirts of Damascus, Umar bin Sa'ad received the message that the prisoners were not to be brought into the capital until Yazid had completed all of the preparations. Imam Sajjad is remembering all of these things. Yazid invited all the ambassadors, foreign dignitaries, leading citizens from around this court. People were ordered to line up the streets. Musicians were brought. People were asked to play music. Dancers were told to dance in the street. Such were the festivities organized by Yazid for the entry of the grandson and the granddaughters of Rasulullah when they came into Sham. They had their hands tied behind their backs and they were on unsaddled camels. These are the children of the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet that they claim to follow. This is the children of Rasulullah, hands tied behind their backs, musicians playing in the street. A carnival was going on. People were dancing and celebrating at the tragedies of the children of Rasulullah. The holy household of Muhammad was led in the city as prisoners. How did they greet the family of Rasulullah? They were surrounded by these dancers and musicians and crowds of citizens were yelling insults at the grandson of Rasulullah. They started throwing stones at Imam Sajjad and the women from the Ahlul Bayt. <laughs> If this wasn't enough, they started throwing embers of coal. They started throwing fire down from the rooftops on the descendants of Rasulullah. Imam Sajjad said, they threw so much fire at me that my amama, my turban became burnt. An elderly man came and approached the fourth Imam. He said, Salam to him. Assalamu alaikum. Imam Sajjad said, Please repeat your salam again. And then he told him to repeat the salam another time. He was asked by the old elderly man, Why did you ask me to keep repeating salam to me? He said, Since my father, Imam Hussein, was killed, I have not been told salam from anyone. <laughs> The man was a companion of the Imam's grandfather, Rasulullah. He said, is there anything that I can do for you? The Imam said to the elderly man, he said, do you see the spear with the head of my father Hussein on it? Please move that spear, tell the soldiers to move that spear and that head to the front of the procession so that they look at the face of Imam Hussein and they don't look at the women from Ahlul Bayt. <laughs> He said, is there anything else, Yamna Rasulullah? Imam replied, yes, if you could bring me a piece of cloth 
so that I can put it under these chains that I have on me. The heat of the sun is killing me. The heat of the sun is making the chains so hot that they're burning my skin. If you bring me a piece of cloth, I can put it under these chains and perhaps my skin won't burn anymore. <laughs> it's reported that when Imam Sajjad was martyred after the poison had taken its course, Imam Bakr salam, went to carry out the burial rites. He went to do the ghusl mayat for his father. He noticed the marks on his knees, those were from the prostrations, the long prostrations he made praising Allah. He noticed the marks on his shoulders and those were from the bags of food he carried to the poor families. Then he noticed another mark on the neck of Imam Sajjad and that was from the scar where they had the iron collar and chains that he was forced to wear on the way to Sham. Our Imam was in chains and had a collar around his neck. When Imam Sajjad entered the court courtyard of Yazid, Omar, Omar bin Sa'ad formally presented Imam Hussein's head to Yazid. Yazid with one cup of wine in one hand, he accepted this as an ultimate symbol of victory and commanded Omar bin Sa'ad to call out the names of the prisoners. He was said, who is this young man? It was said, who is this young man? The reply that he was Ali ibn al-Hussein. But I thought that Ali ibn al-Hussein was killed in Karbala. Imam Sajjad read to recall this and he replied, that was not me, this was my brother Ali Akbar. Now Imam Sajjad is having to recall that tragic moment when he saw Ali Akbar killed in Karbala with a spear sticking out of his chest. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> The prisoners were brought before Ibn Ziyad, Sheikh al Mufid. He reports that Ibn Ziyad sat on his throne and in front of him was the head of Imam Hussein. He frequently poked at the face of the Imam with his cane. Ya Allah. There was an old companion of Rasulullah in this place. When he saw that, he stood up and he said, to stop that, he said, take your cane away from those lips. Wallahi, I have seen those lips kiss the lips of Rasulullah. Rasulullah would kiss Imam Hussein. How are you poking at the head of the grandson of Rasulullah? Ibn Ziyad was filled with rage. He said, oh old man, how dare you interrupt our celebrations of the victory? of our Imam Yazid ibn Muawiyah. They considered Yazid as their Imam. Because of your old age, I spare your life and leave my court immediately. Yazid tells them to kill Imam Ali Zain al-Abidin. Yazid tells them to kill Imam Sajjad. But Sayyid Zainab steps forward and says, if you want to kill him, then you must kill me first. Yazid says, then kill them both. A small child comes forth and he says to Yazid, do you know that when Fir'aun called Musa and Harun to his court, he wanted to kill them too, but he couldn't do it. Do you know why? Yazid said, no, I don't know why. Do you know that when the brothers of Yusuf threw him into that well, they wanted to kill him too, but they couldn't. Do you know why? Yazid said, no, I don't know why. The young child replied, it's because Fir'aun and the brothers of Yusuf were of legitimate birth. They were not illegitimate, they were the sons of their parents. Where it is, is mentioned that the killers of the prophets and Ma'sumin are of illegitimate birth. If you kill my father, you will prove what you are. This young child was none other than the fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Bakr He witnessed the tragedy of Karbala with his own eyes. He was present there as a young child. The same Imam was asked later in his life who was the most madhloom, who was the most oppressed one in Karbala. The Imam told him that it was none other than Sayyidina Zainab. Because every time they wanted to whip anyone from amongst them, Sayyidina Zainab would get in front of them to shield them. Sayyidina Zainab was whipped every time so much that it was hard for her own husband to recognize her when she came back. Ya Allah. <laughs> 
Yazid turned towards Imam Zain al Abidin and he said, Well, you can tell us who has been victorious on this day. The Imam looked at him and replied, Yazid, final victory can only belong to those on the right path. Let us look at you and look at Hussein, my father, whom you got killed so mercilessly was the grandson of Rasulullah who had said that Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Hussein minni wa anna min Hussein. He was born a Muslim and he upheld the laws and principles of Islam his entire life. You are the grandson of Abu Sufyan and Hind who spent their lives fighting against Rasulullah. Yazid was now greatly embarrassed to silence the Imam. He told them to call the Adhan when the Mu'adhan cried out, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. <laughs> Imam Zain al Abidin said, Yazid, speak the truth. Was Muhammad my grandfather or your grandfather? Yazid ordered, those prison, ordered the prisoners to be moved to a prison. But it wasn't just a prison, it was a dungeon. Only part of it had a roof and the rest was open to the sky. An iron grill was around this prison so that no one could get in or out. <laughs> ya Allah. Bibi Zainab said that the place was so cold at nights that no one could have proper sleep and it was so hot in the day that it felt like an oven. It was here that our fourth Imam still under these chains. The ladies and the children spent many great agonies and spent many days in this dungeon of Yazid. Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'oon. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein.